truth is stranger than fiction. In fact, they're often getting harder and harder to tell apart. In some of the presentations you've seen today, you notice how surreal the world is becoming? Well, if you want to see, if you want to understand the present, go back, say, 50 years, 60 years, and read some of the science fiction that predicted the kind of world that we'd be living in today. Kurt Vonnegut's first novel, Player Piano. You know what a player piano is? It's a piano which has been designed to play itself, as opposed to a piano player, who's a human being, who must make music from the instrument. The novel, in brief, was a story of how engineers were decided to be the leaders of society, the ones who knew best, and they made machines which did all the work. And this was massively disruptive because everyone became out of work and had nothing to do. This led to a robot uh, human war and a kind of a revolution, and this was how the story goes. And it's actually quite predictive of many of the things that have happened today. And now, when did all of this start? The Industrial Revolution uh, began in around 1760 and went to around 1840, 1860. It was probably one of the most disruptive and beneficial uh, turnings of the pages of human history. In fact, it, had, it held so much promise that suddenly, uh, of course, it, it did damage to the environment and, and uh, put many people uh, in slave labor conditions, but at the same time it created massive wealth and made it possible for many people to enjoy things that they had never dreamed of before. We heard earlier today about the eight-hour day. Actually, this history goes back almost 200 years. In 1817, uh, partly as a means of correcting for the uh, 10 to 16 hours in dirty and dangerous conditions, working in caves and uh, caves, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, coal mines, and also uh, with machine children working all this time, the fact that machines could do the work for you was considered a great promise. And labor unions actually held out this um, movement: labor and rest and recreation. This, then, the extension of this was taken up by a man named Frederick W. Taylor, who was the author of The Principles of Scientific Management, and he's famous for his time studies. He would measure how long it took for someone to move from A to B, and all of the various uh, movements that they did, and try to make them as, fish, as efficient as a machine. And in fact, the very year that he died uh, was also coincided with a movement in art uh, known as mecha mechanomorphism. Uh, Jacob Epstein's rock drill is a complete morph of a human and a rock drill into a single unit. But 100 years after the promise of the Industrial Revolution, what do we have? We are suddenly cogs in the machine. We are still working. We're still working on life-work balance. I understand in Norway you've solved the problem. But <laughs> most of the world are working, uh, particularly from in Japan where I work, they work many, many hours. Or in uh, Silicon Valley, 80 hours a week or more. And this continues to go, although it's become much more subtle now, because the machines have become very sophisticated and they've become very organic. Ray Kurzweil wrote a book in 2005, which then became a movie, uh, called The Singularity is near, and it's about the, uh, what he describes as the surpassing of human biology, augmented humanity, and this is made possible by uh, a combination of various technologies and uh, disciplines such as genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, which then not only are accelerating exponentially, but are joining together so that we can create we can print organs, we can print skin, we can do all of this stuff. And yet, though he mentions in the movie that technology is a double-edged sword, there isn't much airtime given to the negative side, the downside of this. And so I'm here today to mention a little bit about what might be happening when we pursue this path and what happens to us as machines begin to overtake our abilities. We think nothing of using smartphones uh, to, to navigate uh, by car or to research the internet wherever we go. We have, you have free Wi-Fi almost everywhere I see in, in Norway. Uh, you, you do automated check-in at the airport. You send money uh, from the bank account without even seeing any, any cash. It's a cashless society. You can download media of almost any type you want. 
And in addition to big data, we also have pharmaceutical tools. Uh, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, which was something that didn't exist when I was in school. <laughs> it's, been, it's been created, and now they use a pill called Ritalin to treat the disease. But it doesn't treat the disease, it just drugs kids into submission. Now what happens when they get off the medicine, and what happens when they get out of school? That is scary. Not all software engineers, um, well, Ray Kurzweil is the chief engineer at Google, I understand. He's, he was responsible for um, um, inventions such as uh, optical rec uh, character recognition and speech recognition. He's a brilliant inventor. Uh, he's won uh, massive awards. And yet, uh, Brett Victor is also a software engineer. I think he was responsible for some of the iPad interface and some of the Mac OX system. Well, he wrote a brilliant article called Pictures Under Glass, and the subtitle was A Rant Against the Future of Interactive Design. It starts with a very cool movie in which people are doing all the things they do on the iPhone, but in the air. You'd walk into a Starbucks, and, and you get a coffee latte. Or you um, move your hand this way, and some machine will begin to respond. And it looks like a, a promotion for the future, uh, and yet then he says this is actually an extension of the future which will basically hamstring us and take away our ability to do anything because the hands are designed to do much more than just tap and swipe. Think about it. You hold things, you manipulate things, you make things, you feel things, temperature. All of this is gradually taken away when we just tap and swipe. Whatever happened to handwriting? Do you handwrite much during the day? Do you take notes? I think they still teach it in school, although I know in the United States there are many parents who are saying to teachers, why do you even waste a minute on this when everything is just tappable and voice recognition? However, recently the Wall Street Journal published an article which, in which they demonstrated that with uh, magnetic resonance image, imaging of what happens in the brain when you just tap or type on a keyboard versus when you handwrite, and it's the handwriting that lights up the whole brain. Are we really ready to throw this out just because of convenience and cool uh, technology? And dancing. The New England Journal of Medicine was doing a study on dementia and what kinds of activities help prevent dementia. And they found that social dancing was one of the best preventions of uh, dementia, something like 76% preventive. But not all physical activities had that. In fact, cycling and golf had almost zero connection to preventing dementia. Thank you. So, Brett Victor says the future is in our hands. And how we use our bodies, the question is, are we using our bodies or are we letting the machines, as in player piano, doing the work for us? Here in Norway, I just heard last week, there was an, in the newspaper, uh, that 30% of high school students hate physical exercise. They hate physical education. And if you hate something, you're not going to do it. It's also true in the UK. Uh, Public Health England talks about how children, it's recommended that they get an hour of exercise a day. If you have children, you know that that's not that hard to do an hour of vigorous exercise, and yet 70% of the children in the UK are not getting an one hour of physical exercise a day. So what does it mean to be sedentary? The Pentington Biomedical Research um, Institute came out with a definition of sedentary, and they said it's 60 hours a week sitting on your seat. 60 hours a week. If you do the math, you'll find that's about eight, between eight and nine hours a day. Now, if you have a desk job, You've already got at least six there. And you go back and you watch a movie, that's another two. You're sedentary. And moreover, they found that even if you got, on top of that, 45 minutes of vigorous exercise every day, you were still defined as sedentary and therefore highly at risk for such diseases as cardiovascular conditions, cancer, obesity, osteoporosis. In fact, they said that sitting and being sedentary, sitting 60 hours a week, is worse than smoking. Watching an hour of television can take 22 minutes, it can shorten your life by 22 minutes, according to another study. And yet, we also have the, the singularity approaching. And the misleading metaphors, medical doctors will say, oh, your knee is, has worn out, you need a new one? No problem, we'll replace it. Hips, organs, skin, 
we'll replace it. And an article in Time Magazine not uh, long ago said that there's a possibility that by replacing all of the damaged parts, you could actually theoretically live forever. However, if you become a couch potato, you will not live forever. <laughs> okay. So I think the fast track to the singularity is not technical, technological advancement. And there's a lot of very cool things and a lot of very positive developments, and we've seen some of them in the talks today. But they're not positive if we're going the other way. <laughs> if we're letting all of these devices, um, for example, calculating in your head, if you use a calculator all the time, um, you're going to be back to counting on your fingers, right? <laughs> so the sedentary lifestyle, and then why is, not, why is exercise not working? Why do the kids hate it? Well, I think one reason is that it's taught in a very mechanical way. You go to the gym and you work on machines. You count how many laps did you do, how much weight could you lift. It's all about numbers and uh, matching yourself to some sort of competitive thing, and that is not fun. Fitness has no longer been fun. So what this leads to is disconnected body movement. Uh, imagine, for example, if you were to loosen all of the, the uh, bolts that hold the tire to your car and all of the fasteners and moving parts, and you were to loosen those and then take your car for a spin. It wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> and yet that's how we exercise. Some of the warm-ups that we do actually make it worse. So this makes exercise not fun. And, of course, some kids love sports, but uh, for the most part, apparently, they don't. This leads to the phenomenon in Japan we call the three-day priest. The first day, he buys the gear, the begging bowl, the hat, the robes. The second day, he gets bored, and when nobody's looking, by the third day, he's already quit. <laughs> okay. So, what is the solution to this? If you look, this namba, I define as the art of physical finesse as opposed to fitness. Fitness is also a result you get from it, but physically being skillful in the way you use your body and making it fun to interact with how you use your body. There are sim three simple principles, which I will demonstrate. But if you look at the words, don't force, don't twist, don't disconnect, and you take away the don't, you have a perfect description of a medieval torture machine called the rack. <laughs> okay? Forcing, twisting, and ultimately disconnecting. The first principle I would like to demonstrate with my friend Espen here. What is forcing? Okay, forcing is basically using muscle or leverage or if you could place your hands here. And I will push against his, he's bigger than I am, and stronger and younger. And so it's very difficult for me to move him by pushing against the ground. In fact, that actually stabilizes him. However, let's move back here so you can see what my feet are doing. If, as you see the exercise here, I take my weight off my feet, what does that do? It's almost impossible to be tense when you're actually walking. That's why people take a walk to relax. So I just take a walk in place. And then I can suddenly move him very easily. <laughs> okay? So the exercise, the way you would practice this, we call this namba walking in place. When you step, you, you move like a cat, which is the same side. If you watch cats, they will, they will move this way, okay? Except that we are not on all fours. So we just stand straight and move this way, okay? And then you can actually Speed it up. But same side. <laughs> Having done that, it's even easier <laughs> to move him. <laughs> and I have done this with a professional sumo wrestler, and I actually pushed him out of... <laughs> we weren't doing sumo in, in the ring, but I pushed him, and people watching said, is that real? Is he really trying? And I asked him, have you ever experienced being pushed this way? And he said, yes but only by veteran wrestlers. So I said, right. Namba's got, got to the secret of uh, how to move without forcing. Don't twist. When many forms of exercise, we twist and we torque and we get the feeling, ah, and you strain your body. So I'll do a simple demonstration here using a, a tenugui, which is a Japanese towel. Espen, if you could place your palms out like this. Now, I'm going to try to twist and torque and take this away, and he will also twist back and try to stop me. He doesn't have far to go. But when I twist, when I start to twist my body, I signal everything so he can easily stop me, easily see. <clears throat> what if I were to take away any sense of twisting? Whoa. <laughs> 
you, you, in effect, you remove, any, you don't signal anything. Can't, even though he knows it's coming, he's going to be ready this time. Okay. And one more. In addition to the Namba quick step, we have something we call Namba rotary arms. Now, many forms of exercise, people train, say, just the abs or just the biceps, or they'll work on, on uh, power lifting to, to train different parts of the body. And that will build strength. However, that strength is almost worthless when you actually pit it against something much stronger than you. For example, my arm is not strong enough to come down. In fact, my entire body weight is not strong enough to bring this down. What happens if I connect this motion through my shoulder blade to the motion of the other side? I can move him very easily. And he feels no, so I can actually keep, keep going and throw him, but there's no mat here, so I won't do that. So what the motion is, it looks like something you see in martial arts, even, you know, like Bruce Lee style. But we would do this, again, very fast. It can be done even to music. I tried this in Australia, and it started raining. <laughs> Doing it in a group, so... It rains enough already in Norway, so we won't do that. Okay, thank you, Aspen. So discipline is something that you don't do to yourself. It's something you do for yourself. Discipline is something you don't do to other people, like the kids, because they will resent it. It's something for them. You perhaps remember in The Karate Kid, the movie, the scene, wax on, wax off, and he's uh, waxing the cars and painting the house and sanding the floor. And he says, you know, I don't want to be your goddamn slave. I'm going home. But he says, no, show me wax on, wax off. And he goes like this. He says, no, no, show me. It was a connected motion. And then he found that he had already learned karate just by making these motions. And Namba is very much like that. 10,000 hours is considered the required amount of time to really master something at a world-class level. If you want to do that in one year, do the math, it takes about 27 hours a day. Not happening. <laughs> if you want to do it in three years, it requires nine hours a day of deep practice. This is whether it's true for the violin or uh, marathon running or whatever. Nine hours a day of deep practice. More likely 10, 10 years, and even that's three hours a day. We have many applications in sports and music, and uh, they're very exciting, and we have a, actually a workshop that we will show you a little bit later. But I think the important thing, please, yeah, is to teach the children, because Movement is learned. The wolf boy was raised by wolves. He walks like a wolf. We think we know how to walk, but actually we're just copying. We think we know how to exercise and how to do sports. We're just copying what we see from others. And, and yet, because that's unpleasant, people are sitting down too much, not exercising, putting themselves at great risk of serious diseases, which is going to raise taxes and everything. If you don't take the trouble, the trouble will take you. Thank you.